Everyone hopes to maintain vitality, experience achievements, enjoy close relationships, and share in successes in life. These are all part of our psychosocial health. As caregivers working in a residential care facility, we are often very concerned about the physical well-being of our residents. We want to make sure they're consuming good, nutritious meals. We want to make sure they're well-groomed. But it's also very important to be concerned about the psychosocial well-being of our residents. Psychosocial well-being looks at the resident as a person, as an individual. And today we're going to discuss some important components about caring for the psychosocial needs of the resident. Let's look at some important information we should have on each resident in order to meet their psychosocial needs. As a resident is admitted into the facility, we should review the following considerations. Family history and significant relationships. Privacy issues. Is a resident outgoing or did they tend to like to be alone a significant amount of time? How about their career? What did they enjoy doing professionally? Hobbies and interests. What did they take particular pleasure in? Sports, arts, etc. Is there a history of psychiatric illness, such as depression or anxiety? What were the resident's previous coping mechanisms and comfort measures? Those will play an important role as we provide comfort to that resident. What is the resident's view towards spirituality? Do they practice a particular religion? We should also know about cultural considerations. Where did the resident grow up? What was their lifestyle? Has the resident suffered any significant losses in their life? If so, what? How did it affect them? And finally, what about accomplishments? Significant events in their life for which they gain a good deal of esteem. Much of this information is going to be obtained during the admission process. As your administrator or other individual responsible for the admission of the resident assists that individual to move into the community, they are going to ask lots of questions. So it's important for you to communicate with your supervisor about the particular needs of each resident. Now, this information is also obtained through regular monitoring of the resident. There's no reason when we are in there tidying up their room or making their bed or assisting them with a shower that we can't talk about their rich life history and learn more about them as a human being. Residents living in a residential care facility certainly have a variety of needs. In order to serve our residents, we want to understand their view of the world. Now, it may be very different from ours. Their cultural background may be very unique, very different. Their idea of God and spirituality may be very different from ours. Some residents have families that are very supportive and involved, while others do not. Some of our residents have recently suffered very significant real losses in their lives that is certainly going to impact how we're going to deliver good psychosocial care. It's helpful to have a structure to follow as we understand meeting the psychosocial needs of our residents. There is a very famous psychologist, Abraham Maslow, that has defined some structure for us. Let's look at his analysis of meeting the psychosocial needs. Maslow defined a hierarchy of human needs. Basically, his concept says we must meet certain fundamental foundation needs and then we are going to move upwards from there. Maslow's hierarchy of needs is built upon first meeting the physiological or physical needs of the resident. Now this may include proper nutrition, fluids, sleep, even air to breathe are included in the basic physiological needs. When a resident cannot provide physiological needs for themselves, 
proper care must be given to them for the resident to survive and ultimately have their needs met. Sometimes care providers become overly focused on meeting the physical needs of the residents and don't move on to also meeting the psychosocial needs. Next on Maslow's hierarchy of needs is security and safety. A comfortable place to live, appropriate clothing, and an environment free from abuse or neglect can be all part of meeting the resident's need for security and safety. When a resident moves into the residential facility, they may feel very frightened and insecure as their familiar surroundings are no longer present. Moving up on the hierarchy of needs, we go to love and a sense of belonging. The caregiver working in the residential community may promote a sense of love and belonging in many ways, encouraging attendance at activities or finding a nice dining seat with friendly table mates for the new resident can be two important ways. Also, as a caregiver, you can encourage family ties and bonds that strengthen the sense of still belonging to their families. Esteem. Esteem is how the resident feels about him or herself. This can be significantly affected as the resident ages, and particularly as physical or cognitive limitations increase. A resident may have worked very hard their whole life and have a strong sense of pride and identity in what they have accomplished, yet now that they are not able to walk across the dining room, comb their own hair, or toilet independently, their sense of esteem can certainly be affected. Now look at that gorgeous lady. Yeah. Yep. That's a gorgeous lady. Yeah. Not me, of course. Uh, of course. Allowing the resident to do as much as possible for themselves can increase esteem. The focus of Maslow's work was self-actualization. Self-actualization means understanding why I am here on this earth. What is my purpose? So understanding Maslow's hierarchy of needs helps us to understand and put structure to the psychosocial needs of our residents. Now that we've reviewed Maslow's hierarchy of needs, let's take a look at how we as caregivers can make a difference in the lives of our residents. Let's begin with reviewing those physiological needs. With each resident, look at what can I do personally to make sure that the physiological needs of my resident are being met. Simple things, such as making sure they're having enough to eat, enough fluid, making sure that they're physically well cared for, they're clean, they're well groomed, they feel physically good about themselves. Is their room temperature appropriate? Because, for example, you can have the most fabulous activity in the world going on down in the activity room. But if your resident is in pain and uncomfortable, they're not going to want to participate in that activity. Let's talk about security and safety. How can we help our residents to be secure and safe? Well, number one, we'll want to follow all the safety protocol in our facility regarding monitoring our residents. But helping them feel secure in their environment is truly our job. It's the little things that really matter. One very important thing we'll want to do is always be honest with our residents. We never want to lie to our residents. We never want to trick our residents. Now later on as we talk about dementia care, there is something known as getting into the resident's reality. But we never want to fool a resident or trick them. We want to keep our word. For example, one good way to build security is if we tell a resident we're going to be in their room at 10 a.m. to give them a bath, we want to make sure we're there right on time. Now if something comes up and we cannot be there at 10 a.m., we'll go down there and say, Mrs. Smith, I'm going to be a few minutes late in that shower. I thought I could be here by 10, but I'm running a few minutes late with something else I'm doing. But I will be right down to take care of you as quickly as I can. That builds a sense of trust and a sense of safety. Another example, if you have a resident that perhaps tends to wander in and out of other residents' rooms, 
You'll want to make sure they're appropriately engaged in activities and being monitored carefully so they do not enter a residence room against that residence will. It can be very frightening to have someone walk in on you in your room when you're not expecting it. And that certainly will not promote their sense of feeling safe. After the residents. So the residents know who they're being cared for so that they don't feel like they're simply being surrounded by strangers. Let's talk about how we can promote a sense of love and belonging. If you have ever attended a social event and felt completely out of place, like you just didn't belong there and you didn't know anyone and you didn't feel as though you had someone to converse with, you know that awkward feeling. And that's just how many of our residents feel, especially upon moving in our residential facility. So as caregivers, one of the first and foremost things we want to do is encourage friendship and bonding amongst the residents. And there are several ways to do this. One of which is anticipate as they come in the facility. What seat are they going to take in the dining room? Where are we going to encourage them to initially sit in the living room and so on? So that they can be surrounded by people of similar interests. Introduce the residents by name. Now in some facilities when a new resident comes in, the administrator may choose to ask other residents to wear a name tag so it's easy for the new resident to learn everyone's name. You can also encourage a sense of belonging by helping that resident learn their routine in the facility so they feel like they're part of the group. They know when it's time to come down for meals and so forth. We can also encourage a sense of love and belonging by educating our residents about others within the community that have similar interests. For example, Mrs. Smith, I'd like you to meet Mrs. Jones. You know, she grew up in the same part of Wisconsin that you did, and you know she's a, a fabulous knitter just like you. I'm sure you'll have a lot to talk about one with another. Forming those friendships and bonds are very important within the facility. Now, while we want to form friendship and bond in the facility and help the resident feel loved within our residential community, we also want to make sure that the resident still has a sense of belonging with the social circles they were in outside of the community. For example, their family. We can do this by helping them still feel a very important part of their family, by inviting the family in to have a good time with us in our facility. When the family does come to visit, making them feel comfortable and warm and welcome. Our residents want to feel as though they're still a significant part of their family. Encouraging friendships that the resident had outside of the facility will continue. Uh, inviting the resident to encourage an old friend to come for lunch or come watch a movie with the resident. All of that can promote that sense of love and belonging. Something as simple as knowing your resident's name and using it properly can help them feel an important part of the residential facility. Let's look at Maslow's point regarding esteem and recognition. Now this is an area as a care provider you can make a big difference. You can help those residents still feel good about themselves. Allow the resident to do as much for themselves as they possibly can. Focus on what they are still capable of doing rather than on their limitations. If a resident becomes very frustrated saying, oh, I, I, I'm just useless, I can't do anything for myself anymore, direct that resident towards what they're still capable of doing and what they still do a good job at. We can also recognize things in the resident's life that were very significant to them. Remind them about the fabulous family that they raised and what three great kids they have, for example. Or remind them of some of their professional accomplishments. This all builds towards the resident having a good sense of esteem. With self-actualization, this is not something that we can give to our resident. This is something within them that they will realize. But by providing a good, safe physical environment, promoting a sense of security and safety, making sure that the resident has a good feeling of esteem and uh, recognition of their accomplishments in life can all lead towards self-actualization.
caregiving goes well beyond meeting the physical needs of our resident. It includes meeting their mental needs and cognitive development. It includes social interaction and also spiritual and emotional well-being. Caregivers play an important role in meeting all these needs for our residents. While large planned recreational events are the hallmark of a good activities program, the small things and daily life pleasures is what really gives true meaning to our residents' lives. Residents enjoy being involved in activities that make sense. Here's where our caregiver's role can play the most important part in meeting the overall well-being of our residents. Our caregivers can encourage participation by greeting our residents with a smile, inviting them and announcing to them what's taking place in the activity room, by offering to escort them, and by making sure that when they're seated that they are comfortable and with perhaps somebody that with shared interests. Some of the caregiver things that we generally do with our residents include making sure that their physical needs are met. Why not have a spa day with the residents instead of a simple bath day? Sometimes the residents respond to when would they know it's special attention given to them. Prepare your bath with warm towels and perhaps some luxury scents that may be enticing and also relaxing. Soft music also helps create a mood and reduce possible behavior disturbances. Building self-worth among our residents is very important. Making sure they attend appointments at the beauty shop and barber shop are very good for our residents. In addition to that, perhaps preparing a nail clinic and having residents participate in getting their nails done. What's also nice and adds a special touch is perhaps to use some lotion and increase their sensory awareness with hand massages or even shoulder massages. Exercise programs are also a wonderful way to begin a day and start an energetic morning. Six, seven. Eight, nine, ten. Caregivers can often do some simple exercises, range of motion e exercises, large motor skill exercises, things that involve the resident in groups and even one-to-one. -one. Residents should be encouraged to participate in things that really increase their mental stimulation. Word games, spelling bees, math problems, sometimes crossword puzzles or other kinds of cognitive games really create a spirit of competitiveness and also a growth for our residents. They can be fun, staff can easily participate, and caregivers can truly have an enjoyable time with our residents. When thinking about mental stimulation, don't forget reminiscence, a very important factor. Things that the residents did in the past are very helpful. They bring fulfillment and enjoyment to the residents and also stimulate their long-term memory. Why not talk about things of the past, like the old school days, or things that the residents enjoy doing, like perhaps purchasing their first car, or maybe talk about the holidays or the seasons. Things that you like to do in, the everyday, in your everyday life are things that the residents can share with. It's not unusual to hear residents happily learn the children's names of our caregivers or really want to know how they're doing in school. All these things create a better relationship between the caregiver and the resident. Things that you share in your communities are just as important and valuable for our residents to know and share so they can be connected to the life outside of their community that they live in. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Music reaches the hearts and souls of many of our residents and also our caregivers. Why not join them in some songs that are familiar to everybody? It helps celebrate the day. Quality of life issues are things that are most meaningful to our residents. Our residents also have the need to do for others. Our residents also have the need for growth. Never forget to include in your caregiving invitations for your resident to help. Residents can certainly help with the daily chores of your community. It's okay to ask a resident to help set the table. And it's okay to ask a resident to help fold towels or perhaps do some other household chores that are very meaningful to the resident. It makes them productive and feels like they are contributing. Another aspect of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, giving them the sense of belonging. It's important for our residents to feel very connected to the world outside of the walls that they live in each day. 
Remember to bring them outside to the gardens or to walk the paths that are provided for you. It's always nice to share a cool glass of lemonade or a cup of tea together outside. Many residents enjoy working outside, tending to some vegetables or some flowers that they may have decided to grow, giving them opportunities to care for another living thing. Talk about emotional comfort. Sometimes pets play a large part of helping our residents. They build a connection to the residents' companion pets and certainly enjoy the time spent with them. Choose pets that are gentle and kind and certainly respond to staff's commands. It's always fun to have a friend and in our communities friends are very valuable. Becoming a friend to our resident will make the difference between a resident truly being isolated or not. Although there is a significant occurrence of depression in the elderly, it is not a normal process of aging. We want to be very aggressive in reporting any signs or symptoms we see to our supervisors should we observe any depressive symptoms in our residents. Let's talk about what a resident would look like if they are depressed. Now remember, not every resident will exhibit every one of these signs and symptoms. But if you see some of these emerging, let your supervisor know. Number one, change in sleep patterns. Now for many individuals, it's that they spend more time in bed and want to sleep more. But actually it can be the opposite. Some residents will complain they can't sleep properly through the night. So a change in sleep patterns will definitely want to report. Secondly, change in appetite, lack of interest in meals that they once enjoyed, or sometimes it's the opposite. The resident is eating incessantly. Number three, change in activity patterns. Maybe the resident is becoming more lethargic, doesn't want to do as much as they once did. Number four, they lack joy or meaning in their usual activities. They just don't seem to enjoy things like they once did. Number five, isolation. You may find that the resident is staying in their room more and more or even if they are out in a common area in the residential facility, they're seated off alone to their side. They don't want to be part of the group. Number six, you may also see that the resident is exhibiting physical signs or symptoms. Tummy aches, frequent headaches, general malaise, just not feeling good. Now, of course, this can be an indicator of many other things as well, but we'll want to report that to our supervisor. Number seven, changes in their mood or their emotional well-being. For example, you may see that a resident cries more or you may see that a resident simply loses control, has outbursts of anger more often. This can also be indicative of depression. Number eight, you may also even hear suicidal thoughts. Now sometimes that doesn't come across as, I want to kill myself but rather more subtle indications. You may see, for example, a resident begins giving some of their favorite possessions away, things they once treasured. Or you may hear residents simply say things like, oh, I'm tired, I've lived long enough, or I don't really want to go on like this. These are definite indications of depression that we will want to report immediately to our supervisor. The important thing we want to remember as caregivers is that we report if we see changes in our residents so that action can be taken. Because like many other diseases, depression is treatable in the elderly. There's much we can do. For example, after an appropriate diagnosis has been made, and the doctor will do several things, lab work, uh, perhaps scans will take place, uh, they'll maybe do a psychiatric evaluation with interview. But once a definitive diagnosis of depression has been made, there is much that can be done for the resident. Some residents are managed with medication. And it's important that we as caregivers make sure they get that medication on time and as scheduled. Cognitive and other forms of therapy are also very helpful with 
the treatment of depression in the elderly. So your resident may be encouraged to go out for therapy sessions. We'll want to make sure that takes place as ordered by the physician. Maintaining an open communication with the resident, allowing them to express their concerns to us, listening attentively to what they have to say. Sometimes just a reassuring pat on the hand that they know we care and we are concerned about them can be very good medicine for depression. Encouraging the resident to find as many moments of meaningful time throughout the day as possible. Maybe they don't want to go play bingo for an hour, but maybe they're happy to come and sit out on the patio next to you for 15 or 20 minutes. Encouraging human contact as the resident desires can be helpful. We as caregivers can play a very important role in helping the residents meet their spiritual needs. One of the first things we want to remember is we all have our own personal beliefs and ideas about how religion should be expressed. Our idea of religion may not be the same as the resident's idea, but we want to demonstrate and show respect of their personal religious beliefs. In order for the resident to meet their spiritual needs, one of the first things we can do is assist them in their physical environment. If there is something in particular that they would like in regards to meeting their spiritual needs, for example, maybe a resident would like some sort of a small shrine on their dresser, or maybe they want a particular cross or religious plaque hung on the wall. These things can be very important to a resident, particularly if they are not able to go out to their church or synagogue any longer. We also can help meet their spiritual needs by arranging for transportation, for them to attend the church of their choice, or if they prefer, uh, we can assist them in having visitors come in and meet with them, pray with them, and discuss their religious concerns with them. For example, uh, very often the sisters will come through our facilities and provide individual communion to each resident. This can be very meaningful for our residents that are not able to attend Mass and take communion. Additionally, we want to make sure we provide privacy for the resident. If they are having a, a time for prayer or meditation, we want to make sure that they're not interrupted. We also want to make sure that their religious rights are not being infringed upon by others within the community. Some of our residents become uh, zealous about their own personal religious beliefs and may try to um, encourage other residents to participate in their religious lifestyle. If you feel a resident is being pushed or coerced by another resident, it's time for us to intervene and remind everyone that we need to respect our own religious beliefs. One of the most overlooked issues related to the psychosocial care of our residents is sexuality. Our residents are sexual beings. In the residential care facility, there may be times that residents want to form intimate relationships with other people. It is important that we provide adequate privacy for our residents, that we knock before entering the room, etc. It is also very important that our residents be involved in consensual relationships. If you have a concern about the intimacy between residents, always speak to your supervisor or administrator so that an appropriate evaluation can take place. Do not laugh or smirk or giggle when residents talk about their sexual needs or talk about the need for privacy. This is an area also where the resident deserves respect. It may be necessary to encourage your resident to seek professional assistance regarding meeting their sexual needs. Perhaps your resident needs information on safe sex practices, or perhaps your resident has a health concern that is prohibiting them from enjoying their sexual well-being. So again, this is where we will turn to the experts and encourage the resident to speak to a medical professional. Psychosocial care means looking at our resident as an individual human being their needs, their wants, their goals. Remember it is caregivers who are closest to our resident and it is our caregivers who will help our residents achieve quality of life. Mm -hmm.